Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here today to learn from all of us and for us to learn from all of you. It's really wonderful to have everyone in the room. Uh, as was just said, I'm here from the Greater London Authority working on behalf of the mayor. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the GLA is doing in London uh, around digital twins. To give you an overview, uh, this work sits under our chief digital officer, Theo Blackwell. Um, and it relates to a number of teams within the GLA. So unlike many areas of work that are focused within a team at City Hall, for us, digital twins are cross-cutting. So they sit within whatever team needs to use them and needs to create them. That includes the infrastructure team, which I sit on, the environment team, planning, intelligence, culture, across the board. And we develop digital twins at City Hall because we need to answer specific questions. So we don't sort of start from the point of asking, what would be an interesting twin to create? We start from the point of asking, what questions do we need to answer and what tools do we need in order to do that? And it then impacts our decision-making processes because we need those answers to make decisions on the ground. We also pursue partnerships wherever possible. That means with different cities and regions uh, across the UK. That means with local authorities inside of London, our 33 local authorities. It means with infrastructure providers who we work with really, really closely, technical experts who we often contract in, um, suppliers, et cetera. And while some of our digital twins are live, other ones are still in development, so I'll talk you through that. I'm going to give you an overview of all of London's digital twins for a moment, uh, but you'll see the list is quite long, and I'm going to focus on the three that sit within my area of work that I lead on. So this is not even the complete list. Uh, I'll, get, I'll move on to another page that has a few more. Um, but you can see here some of the key questions that we're trying to ask. I won't dwell on this because we're going to talk in depth about the infrastructure mapping application, the underground assets register, and the planning automation project. Uh, but to give you a sense here of other types of work we're doing, uh, we're also looking at planning constraints, we're looking at smart energy management systems, all to answer specific questions, such as how can we reduce energy costs and increase efficiency by anticipating changes in energy demand? That leads to a specific product, this smart energy management system. Here's a few more to give you the full picture. We have a building stock model. We have a cultural infrastructure map. We have various simulators. As you can see, we define digital twins quite broadly. We're not just talking about an exact copy digitally of a piece of infrastructure on the ground. We, we take a, a bit of a wider view, and you'll see that as I talk about the particular uh, tools that we're going to focus on today. So starting with the infrastructure mapping application, this began in 2015, developed at the GLA. We've had quite a few uh, suppliers who've also helped us uh, along the way, including ARUP. Um, and the questions that we're trying to ask around infrastructure mapping are about coordination of infrastructure and also planning. So to, to unpack that a little bit, our team at the GLA, the infrastructure team, is really invested in helping utilities and other infrastructure providers to coordinate on joint street works. So we're asking for changes to business as usual, and we're demonstrating with these uh, sort of forward-thinking utilities that there can be business savings and also environmental benefits, re reduction of road disruption, et cetera, if you jointly deliver street works. So in order to do that, we need to know where are good places to do joint street works delivery. This tool helps us answer that question. The other question that it helps us answer is around planning for growth. So as you all know, the mayor of London is very keen to deliver housing for Londoners, particularly affordable housing, but we can't deliver affordable housing if we don't have the infrastructure in place to support that housing. So this tool helps those infrastructure providers understand where they need to invest in their networks so that they can help deliver that housing and not be a blocker to delivery. You can see here an image of the most recent development of the IMA. We're on version three. We've just recently developed version three, phase one. Version three, phase two is coming. So it's constantly sort of being improved de depending on the different uh, needs that we have. To give you a sense of what's inside of this tool, an enormous amount of data, we have future investment data that we source ourselves from key infrastructure providers like Thames Water, SGN, Caden, et cetera. You see the full list there. And we combine that with important context layers and also information about planning applications, which we get directly from the mayor in terms of the planning policy areas and other data sets like that. And then we also source planning application information in a couple of different ways. I won't dwell on that because we have a whole separate project I'm going to talk to you about around planning applications. Uh, but the idea here is that when you put these layers together, you get a sense of what's happening in London what is going to be delivered. So we're talking mostly about future investment here. Where are the infrastructure providers going to be digging up the road? And where are planning applications likely to come forward as development? So we have over 25,000 data points in the tool in 50 layers. 
Uh, and as you can see, there's two different versions. There's a publicly accessible version, which has on it tons of in important information that is open to industry. All of you in the room could access that public version. It's just online. You don't even need to log in. And that gives you a bunch of, of background information that could be useful for a lot of different purposes, including the ones I just mentioned. But for the key use cases, for the key points about joint infrastructure delivery, we found the need to create a private version of the tool that can, de that can uh, display that really critical infrastructure provision information that isn't appropriate for the public or that wouldn't be at a point of certainty that's suitable for the public. So we're asking our infrastructure providers, where are you likely to invest in three years? They may not be totally certain of that. In fact, most aren't. And so it's important to have an area where you can display that information and find those opportunities for joint infrastructure delivery early enough in the process that you can plan for it. So that's why we have a private version. It is still free, um, but it's only open to those uh, utilities, certain infrastructure providers, and some local authorities, though that's expanding to become all of them in the future, likely, um, who sign a particular NDA that, that governs that group of, of individuals who are sharing data through the tool. It's important to note how this is funded. Most of our digital twin projects are externally funded. This one is funded through the Lane Rental Surplus Fund. I can tell you more about that if you're interested, uh, but that's managed by TFL and by London's utilities and other infrastructure providers. Here's a quick view, it might be a little bit hard to see, um, of the collaboration tool inside the mapping application. So this is a tool within a tool that serves a specific purpose, which is to flag up where infrastructure providers future plans overlap in space and time. So you enter into this tool the distance uh, apart you are interested in for a collaborative street work, so 50 meters, for instance. You want a, a street works within 50 meters of each other. And you uh, indicate the time frame you're interested in between now and 2025, let's say, and who you are. So in this case, maybe we say we are uh, SGN or we are Thames Water, et cetera. You're seeing dummy data, by the way, on the screen. So this is example data. Um, and those uh, two different providers or more uh, clash their plans with each other so you can see where there's an overlap in space and time between their expected delivery. And that gives us the opportunity to identify where there are opportunities for those utilities to dig up the road together or to share supplies or potentially to adjust their plans slightly so that they could do those things uh, and collaborate. Some important next steps to note on this project we're using the IMA actively to identify those collaboration opportunities. We're looking for feedback from all those who use it, both on the public side and the private side. And we're supporting our coordination team at City Hall, who are the people on the ground translating this information into actionable work for the utilities and others. What we found in all of these projects is that it's a combination of the technology, but also of having the right resources in terms of people who can really make the case for why taking action based on a digital twin is useful for a business. Um, and without that, it's just data sitting in a tool that no one's really doing anything with. Uh, we're also, as I said, about to be developing phase two of version three, um, which will focus on that planning for growth piece that I mentioned before, that need for utilities to understand where housing is going to be delivered so that they can prepare for it. Next digital twin project. I, I apologize, this is really a whistle stop tour, but we'll, 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 keep, we'll keep going. Um, the next project is London's Underground Asset Register. Uh, this began uh, because London was already investigating ways to map what is, is, is underground. Uh, Thames Water, one of our utilities, had done a proof of concept called Hades that did in fact map small areas of London uh, to show what utilities and other assets were, were below ground. Uh, and after that, it was decided by London's infrastructure high-level group, which is managed by the mayor, chaired by the mayor, these, these CEO level representatives from all of London's utilities came together and said, we would like a sustainable service that tells us what's underground so that when we dig up the road, we don't hit one another's pipes and cables uh, and we're able to plan better on site for those, for those works. So in receiving that endorsement, that then gave our team the ability to go off and look for a way to make this happen. And fortunately, the Geospatial Commission, which I'm sure you've heard all about today and, and know about already, was already interested in doing a very similar thing for the country. So we joined up with the Geospatial Commission as one of two national pilots exploring the creation of, a, of an underground asset register. So the Geospatial Commission has granted 3.9 million, you're missing that, 3.9 million pounds uh, to two pilot projects, one in London and one in the Northeast. Uh, and these two areas, including London, were selected because of those pre-existing 
efforts to map underground assets. And the goal is to learn some lessons so that central government can consider whether to roll out a national underground asset register, uh, which would be quite a complex and major project. They want to get some learnings first. And from London's perspective, the goal is to do that and also start the process of creating that sustainable service that we had spoken about to begin with. This is just the very first step of that, though. So we have these two pilots in London and the Northeast. After that, government will consider whether to do a regional MVP, and after that, they'll consider whether to do a national rollout. Um, to give you an overview of what we're trying to do, there are five key use cases that we're working towards as part of this project. Safe digging, which is pretty straightforward, avoiding hitting one another's cables and pipes. On-site efficiency, working to, to make on-site work go smoother, not having to dig up so many uh, testing uh, holes, et cetera, to understand where assets might be. Planning uh, on the site so that efficiencies can occur as well. Exchanging data between organizations, which right now happens in quite inefficient ways. And then supporting those joint street works that I talked about previously. That last use case is specific to London, so we brought that one uh, to the table because, as, as you could see from our, from our previous project, coordination is really key to the GLA. This will deliver extremely quickly, so we're looking at a March completion date for this pilot with the focus on those five use cases um, and also gathering stakeholder requirements. So what do the utilities in London and transport providers and telcos need in order to uh, use this tool well, um, both in terms of data modeling and functionality? We, in London, are covering six local authorities, Southwark, Croydon, Tower Hamlets, Newham, Camden, and City of London. Um, and that's where we're going to be mapping underground assets to start with. It would be a very ambitious project to do even those six. So, of course, expanding to all of London was, was out of scope by March, but we do have ambitions in future towards that. Um, and it's important to note that different players are at different stages in terms of data quality. So we are helping in London to uh, elevate some of the data quality issues um, and to resolve them so that we can include all of this data into a tool. I should also mention that Ordnance Survey is the technical partner on the project uh, who's providing a platform for both pilot areas. As I explained before, the sort of structure of the project is the Geospatial Commission at the top, funding the pilots and sort of making them happen, uh, local authorities, infrastructure providers, the GLA Ordnance Survey all playing their roles, for providing data, ensuring that the data modeling work uh, is sufficient to, to serve all the use cases, testing those use cases. There's quite a lot of different work streams, as you may imagine. Also working out the legal agreements that need to be in place to make everyone comfortable to share data in this pilot setting. This is our project timeline to give you a sense of the different activities that are required to do something like this. Um, as you can see, there's a part about understanding what the data, what, what, what the status of the data is to begin with, um, and then providing sample data so that we can understand it before it goes into the pilot platform, harmonizing that data, which means creating a data model, a structure that works for both the Northeast and London, so that we can translate data from Thames Water and also from Northumberland Water into the same tool, as well as all the different sectors. Um, we have a, this vectorization piece around data quality, which really is about uh, the format of the data, not about checking whether the data is accurate. That, I'm afraid to say, is outside the scope uh, for the moment, though we think that bring, bringing together a tool like this really will help data quality in future, because there's the ability to report if you find something in the ground that's different from what you're expecting. So over time, the idea is that utilities and others get an understanding of where their data might need to be tweaked or fixed. Um, some field testing and then the release of the platform. So that's what you can expect through March. And, and do stay sort of uh, plugged in as we progress. And there'll be lots of learnings coming out of this that we hope to share with all of you. Last but not least, and let me see how I'm doing on time, all right, so far, um, is our London Development Database Automation Project. Now, this might not strike you particularly as a digital twin in the way that you think about it, perhaps, but we think it's really key um, in order to understand what's happening on the ground. Ah, I'm seeing that I do need to wrap up fairly soon, so I'll, I'll run through this one quickly. Um, the idea here is that we in London don't actually know where development is occurring at any given moment in a, in a live, accurate way. We have a sense through monitoring of development from local authorities of where their planning applications are coming in, getting permission, starting, and completing. But this is not enough for us, especially not enough for infrastructure providers who need to understand where development is going to occur. So what we're talking about is automating an extremely manual process that right now requires local authorities to report to us by typing into a, an interface, basically, where their planning applications are likely to be. Um, and so instead of that, 
we are proposing and are underway to delivering an automated process that will produce at the end a live feed of planning application data for London. So that means any time a planning application goes valid in London, you, the public, will have access to an open data feed that tells you that, as well as all the way through to completion. So you'll be able to track where in London development is being delivered. Um, and this really will change, we think, the, uh, both the, the, the SME market that relies on this type of data, but also the way that we plan in London um, and the way that we plan for infrastructure in particular. There'll be tons of, of benefits, we think, including savings to boroughs, improved infrastructure planning, the open data uh, stimulating the SME market, et cetera. To give you a sense of where we are in this project, we're right in the middle. We'll be delivering also in March. Many of my projects conclude in March. Um, and it's important to note that uh, this will be available to everyone. So please do keep, keep in touch on that. These are the kind of key takeaways that I, I'm afraid I don't have time to get into the detail on, um, so I want to keep, uh, keep us moving. But the, the sort of highlights are the importance of buy-in from the, from the complex partners, the importance of security, privacy, and open data, and how those all work together, the importance of resourcing properly so that you actually have funding to, to deliver these things, using technology to answer questions and create benefits, um, going from pilots to ongoing services in a way that actually works, getting legal agreements in place that allow everyone to share data, and working on data modeling schema and standards, which are really at the center of all of this work. So thanks very much for that, and I'm sure that we'll talk more in a moment.